ending of a wrestling pay-per-view can make or break the night. A pretty good show was once low-bridged by a flimsy pyrotechnic display meant to resemble a detonation. <coughs> Revolution 2021. A respectable card with a near five-star WWE title bout is more known for its babyface versus executive main event and said match's absurd ending. Here's looking at you, Over the Limit 2012. And let's not forget the WWE's greatest ever pay-per-view ended with one of the most damaging heel turns ever. And while Stone Cold Going Bad didn't break WrestleMania X7, it still left a pretty deep smudge. Now today we're going to talk about a TNA pay-per-view notorious for having a calamitous finish, one facilitated by a troubled star that the organization had put a little bit too much faith into. It's an ending that's beyond infamous and would have tanked any pay-per-view that it finished off. But if it's any consolation at all, it's not like the ending ruined a particularly good show. This one was pretty rotten long before the final curtain. The 2011 Victory Road is one of the worst shows ever. Now, TNA was basically the wily e. coyote of professional wrestling. They'd roll out big, grandiose plans with much confidence and bluster, only to brutally fail at every hurdle, while the audience responded with howls of laughter. Now, if you're like me, you're about six foot tall and named Fraser, but also you may only have a passing interest in what was once known as total non-stop action. And there are a lot of reasons for this. For one thing, most fans under 25 were weaned solely on WWE in a post-Monday Night Wars world, and thus considered all other promotions inferior, whether that was a fair assessment or not. And then there's the fact that TNA had often told us themselves that they were inferior. Now, mind you, they didn't necessarily go out of their way to do this. Through their early years, TNA made a lot of strides towards legitimizing themselves as a genuine alternative to WWE. They upgraded their production, they signed popular free agents, and they produced monthly pay-per-views. They also gained increasingly beneficial time slots on cable TV. Impressive as all those business achievements were, they were often offset by a phenomenon known today as LOL TNA. Now that's when something so mind-bogglingly stupid takes place and takes precedence over any accumulated goodness on a TNA card. And for TNA's first eight years, there was a lot of LOL TNA. Now, here are some of the greatest hits. The sad part was there was so much to like about TNA. Getting past the aging has-beens and failed projects, the roster was filled with world-class athletes and performers, many of whom would make the mark in larger promotions later on. Now, this pay-per-view alone includes AJ Styles, Robert Roode, James Storm, and the Young Bucks, as well as established ex-WWE stars like the Hardy Boys, Bully Ray, Mr. Anderson, and Rob Van Dam. The world champion is 52-year-old Sting, who, in spite of his age, is still a valuable performer with a large fan base. But few high caliber wrestlers or popular stars can overcome lousy creative. I mean, AJ Styles can carry any middling wrestler to a fun TV match, but carrying that Claire Lynch fiasco, he's a, he's a wrestler, not a bloody exorcist. Another classic TNA problem was putting its faith in the wrong people. On the backstage end, repeatedly going to the Vince Russo well proved to be, well, proved to be a mistake. And no matter how much Vinnie Roo tries painting himself as the architect of wrestling at its late 90s peak, his list of bad ideas could cover an inner city mural, even if it was typed in eight point comic sans. And we saw a lot of those bad ideas in TNA. Then there was the dual acquisition of Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff. 
as both performers and shot callers behind the scenes, and they joined TNA about a year before this event. Let's just say it wasn't exactly WCW 1996, and many TNA diehards didn't appreciate some of the tonal shifts that took place in 2010. On the wrestling side, incessantly making Jeff Jarrett the world champion throughout most of the noughties felt very counterproductive. While Jarrett is a skilled heel with a wealth of knowledge to impart, there was just something anachronistic about this new cutting edge promotion having a 70s style territorial heel as its perennial champ. And when fans considered the real life power that co-founder Jarrett wielded in TNA, well, it fostered the wrong kind of heat for old Double J. But at least Jarrett was reliable and dependable. That's more than can be said for another individual that TNA decided to strap the rocket to for this main event. If you've seen Victory Road, I think you know who I'm talking about, but we will discuss him in greater detail a bit later on. But alas, at any given time, TNA's roster could prove stellar. I mean, just look at who was in TNA in the late winter of 2011. You had Kurt Angle, Samoa Joe, Mickey James, The Motor City Machine Guns, Abyss, Jay Lethal, Brian Kendrick, Nick Aldis, The Pope, and Eric Young, even 23-year-old Kazuchika Okada. I mean, talk about a holy grail of wrestling performers. And if this were the holy grail, they'd be collectively Sir Not appearing in this film because none of them, none of them were in action at the 2011 Victory Road. And Angle was the sole individual on the so-called promotional poster, which looked like a combination of a country music album cover and a 1970s style department store studio portrait. Or maybe it's the DVD cover for a direct-to-video memento knockoff starring Jason Statham. Really, there is no way to tell. So if all those performers were left off the card, who actually made it onto the Victory Road one? In the main event, Sting would defend the TNA world title against the man he'd won it from 10 nights earlier on Impact, Jeff Hardy. Now, Hardy had turned heel in the prior autumn and became the centerpiece of the villainous group Immortal, over which he had kind of lorded over as world champion twice since October. Sting, meanwhile, had spurned a WWE offer to face The Undertaker at WrestleMania 27. I know, imagine, what if? And instead, he re-signed with TNA. Now, capitalizing on the news that they actually got one over on WWE for a change, TNA immediately put Sting over Hardy to crown him as the champion once more. The heavily hyped match resulted in Impact's best ratings in five months and spawned this rematch at Victory Road. So far, so good. A notch below the world title bout was a top contenders match between former champions Rob Van Dam and Mr. Anderson. Anderson. Given Van Damme's enduring popularity and the recency in which the electric Anderson worked with some of WWE's top names, you could seemingly do worse than putting these two in the penultimate main event match, especially one with such high stakes. One of the brighter spots for TNA in this period was a group called Fortune, and that consisted of AJ Styles, X Division Champion Frankie Kazarian, and the Tag Team Champions of Beer Money. In addition to feuding with Immortal near the top of the card, Fortune had the, well, fortune of mostly avoiding stupid ideas from bad creative. The quartet was free to just deliver quality matches without being made to look like dopes. Usually. All four members were part of Victory Road. Styles would go one-on-one -on -one with the immortal member Matt Hardy, whose dreadlocks and long trench coat came free with the purchase of Tool's complete discography and three packs of magic cards, apparently. Now, Matt was not yet broken, but rather cold-bloodied, and on his best day could certainly deliver the goods. Now, on paper, he and Styles sounds like a complete blast, one of those matches that you'd only dream of. Now, X Division champion Kaz would defend his title in a four-way Ultimate X match against Robbie E, the future Robert Stone, but instead he was like a knockoff Zack Ryder as a fist bumping Jerseyite, and incidentally, both of the Young Bucks. But they weren't quite the Young Bucks. These were Max and Jeremy Buck, the team of Generation Me. Remember when most of us laughed when Walter became Gunter and Piper Nevin became Dewdrop and Rex Steiner became Braun Breaker? You know who wasn't laughing? Max and Jeremy Buck. That's who. The better named James Storm and Robert Roode defended their world tag team titles against the forgotten duo of Shannon Moore and Jesse Neal, also known as Ink Ink. See, it's because they had like lots of tattoos, which made them different from 
So it didn't make them that different. There was a lot of tag teams back then that just had just covered in tattoos. The only exception would really be, well, Max and Jeremy Buck. In the undercard, the Knockouts tag team titles were on the line with Angelina Love and Winter defending against Sarita and Rosita, the future Zelina Vega. Now, their stablemate from the Mexican-American stable, Hernandez, was set to go one-on-one -on -one with the towering Matt Morgan in a first blood match. And speaking of violence, two ECW originals were set to collide as Tommy Dreamer would face off with Bully Ray following Bully's ruthless double cross of longtime partner, Devon. Now, compare the names that were left off Victory Road to the ones that were featured in the undercard, and it's fair to say that perhaps TNA wasn't making the best use of some of their bigger names. Give a fantasy booker 10 minutes to put together a better eight match card, and what they could concoct is probably a little bit more star studied and imaginative. As for the show we got, well, someone's imagination definitely ran wild with this one, brother. Christ. <laughs> Where'd it even start? Well, there's the fact that this show was apparently seen as some kind of like throwaway pay-per-view by TNA management. And seeing as this was just another card in front of a complimentary audience at Orlando's Impact Zone, and the real money lay in lockdown the following month in Cincinnati, TNA treated Victory Road kind of like battleground to lock down SummerSlam. They barely promoted anything until the final week or two before the show. Now, Victory Road ultimately accounted for 17,000 pay-per-view buys. Now, to put things in perspective, that's about one third of what All In achieved without a weekly cable outlet which to promote the show. Now, granted, wrestling in 2011 and 2018 are worlds apart, but you still have to you still have to wonder. Now, good news for TNA though, that 17,000 was up from February's Against All Odds and on par with January's Genesis pay-per-view. Still, not a great number, but not a free fall either. Now, on the downside, as Dave Meltzer wrote in the aftermath, the numbers of people watching on illegal streams was tons lower than on any TNA show in months. Now, I do wonder how Meltzer was able to measure that number, but I'm not really sure I want to know the answer. Anyway, 17,000 paying home customers were greeted with Dreamer and Bully as the opener. Now, Bully did his usual heel rigmarole and announced that he got the match booked as a no DQ and false count anywhere match. <laughs> what a heel that Bully, eh? Depriving us of the catch and catch can match we'd long been coveting between him and the innovator of violence. So this years long rivalry that included flaming tables, one guy breaking the neck of the other guy's wife, sees Dreamer hit Bully with a giant stuffed minion doll, which Bully bumped off like it was a paint can from Home Alone. Also a blow up doll got involved at one point and Dreamer asked Bully what 81 minus 12 was. And Bully not only gave the correct answer, but he happily, well, showed his working. At that point, we need Bully Ray 69ing a doll. We kind of need like a photo of him doing a 69. Yeah. Now, Bully eventually elbow dropped the doll and he caused it to pop. Now, safe to say, it was one of the only pops we'd hear all night. So the fight continues and Devon and his two sons get involved. Devon helps Dreamer give Bully the 3D through a table, thus giving Dreamer what I assume is very likely his only pay-per-view victory between 2002 and whatever year you're currently watching this video in. So yeah, that was dumb, but it was also a little bit fun. So I guess that makes it like, fum. Fum? Fum? Like a combination of the two words. I would say done, but the camera cuts didn't quite make me convulse on the floor like I just watched Battle Seizure Robots. Do you get the reference? Simpsons. Yes. Next up was the Knockouts Tag Team title match, and this is where we hit just a little bit of a dip. With all due respect to the participants, this was the sort of match that Botchamania was invented for. Hey Matthew, how you doing? There was an inordinate amount of missed time moments, especially considering this match was only five minutes long. The piece de resistance was the ending, in which Winter cradled Rosita, but Sarita rolled her partner on top. The amount of time Rosita held Winter in the pinning predicament before a referee counted the three was frankly pretty ridiculous, considering the major size disparity between the two. Somehow, Winter was unable to kick the that much smaller Rosita off of her, and with ample time to do so too. Add in a dead crowd, and we're really sliding towards the abyss here. But 
not the actual abyss, unfortunately, he would have actually improved the show. Now, what this card does not need is two bad endings in a row. Fortunately, the next contest is Hernandez and Morgan's first blood match. That's a pretty hard match to have a bad ending in. One guy bleeds and the bell goes ding. What if I was to tell you that this match featured one, a weird referee diversion spot involving a scripted fan running, two, the heel blading right on camera, then three, the heel then squirting a container of fake blood onto the torso of the baby face, and four, the confused baby face standing there like dumbass McGee while a second referee runs in, ignores the very bloody forehead off the heel, and sees the dubious red stains on the baby face's chest, and then calls for the bell, declaring the heel the winner. Yet yeah, it doesn't make sense, does it? Presumably, the members of Mexican America were unified by their love of BS endings in pay per view matches. Now, traditionally in these videos, this is the time where we include the star ratings of Dave Meltzer as a point of reference to kind of illustrate the show's quality or lack thereof. But since we're reviewing a crappy TNA card, it's a good time to turn things over to second in command at the Wrestling Observer, Brian Alvarez. Because Brian, Brian is to bad TNA events what sharks are to bleeding victims of a boating mishap. So let's go to Mr. Alvarez's scoreboard. Well, they say one out of three gets you in at the Hall of Fame. Well, Bully's in the TNA Hall of Fame, but I don't think this is what the expression meant. Luckily, there's a reprieve coming. It was as if the showrunners knew that the day off that the card looked emptier than the crowd at a 2018 SmackDown taping and decided to group all three fortune matches together. Yeah, this should fix things. Now, first up was the Ultimate X match with Kaz facing not only two of Tony Khan's EVPs, but also his official impersonator for the coveted X Division Championship. Has to be said, not the greatest Ultimate X match ever. A dead crowd in some off-kilter spots early on kind of lowered the ceiling on this one. The only real story was that Max Buck, that's Matt, vowed to win the title on his birthday, and Jeremy, aka Nick, was going to help him. Then, late in the match, Nickamy decided to go rogue, and he and Max ended up clashing. Kazarian ended up winning following a tightrope spot that was way too rich for this show's blood. I should point out that during the show, there were several vignettes of Jeff and Karen Jarrett celebrating their honeymoon. And by celebrate, I mean Karen got well, all dressed up only to learn that an oblivious Jeff was taking her and their collective children to the theme park at Universal Studios. That's, that's where TNA was filmed and it was free. This made Karen very unhappy. I mean, who could possibly be unhappy with free admission to an attraction at Universal? I mean, besides them. Now, there isn't much to say about Beer Money versus Ink Ink, which is a good thing, because it meant there was no ridiculous gimmicking. It was a standard tag team match with two total pros defending the belts, and the challengers looked good in a competitive bout with pretty much a lot of near falls. Now, beer money retained, leading to Shannon Moore going all like sore loser by spitting beer at them afterwards. Really fun stuff, right? Next up was Styles versus the Sensei of Massitude. And surprise, surprise, another enjoyable match. Now, granted, there was some clunkiness near the end with Ric Flair inserting himself, so the finish came off a little bit confusing. But before then, Styles and Hardy pieced together a 16-minute match of very high-quality wrestling. It was probably the match of the night, which is hardly the first time Styles took that particular accolade home on a TNA show. So let's take a look at the updated standings. Huh. I don't know. I, I kind of thought they'd be a little bit higher. Maybe it's because I sat through those first three matches that the uh, like latter three felt like the back half of any given Wrestle Kingdom. I mean, after Matt Morgan had an existential crisis with ketchup on his chest, pondering whether or not he'd been a hot dog his entire life. You know, a decent tag team bout featuring Ink Ink does feel a bit like Naito versus Tanahashi. But you know what? At least the reliable guys got the show back on track. We've got two matches left and they look pretty decent on paper. Now let's see if we can shoot for a thumbs in the middle. It's kind of teetering upwards, shall we? Next up is Van Damme and Anderson for a world title shot. Now this should be pretty decent, seeing as well Van Damme is Van Damme, and Anderson had his greatest ever match in TNA just a year earlier, a criminally forgotten cage match with Kurt Angle. Safe to assume that three stars or better is doable, but then the match began. It was clunky spot, botch, clunky spot, annoyed crowd, Evident lack of chemistry with some overt swearing after one particular botch. <sighs> it's going to be one of those matches. 
It's like what Buddy Murphy's Law says. Anything that can go wrong, will go wrong. And also, my name's not Murphy anymore. The match is pretty much ruined, and we've still got a number one contendership to decide, so let's just get to the finish. Uh, Anderson hits Van Damme with a mic check on the ramp. And they both got counted out. Why? It's a number one contenders match. You cannot be serious. One positive, though. They woke up the rather dead crowd who were just dumping all over, well, that match and that finish. That's like me leading you through a large snake-infested field just to show you a soiled rubbish bin on the other side. To put into perspective how rotten this was, half the angry crowd started chanting, restart the match, and the other half just screamed no. Seriously, the crowd had like, had enough of this. This was like Simon Cowell pressing the final buzzer, but the act on stage not listening. Alvarez wrote after the finish, you have got to be effing kidding me. Another negative star match? That is how pissed Brian was. He couldn't even think clearly enough to assign a number next to the minus sign. Moving on now, we come to the main event. Yeah. Uh, While what happened has been subject to much mockery and ridicule after the fact, it's not really right to make a joke about the underlying circumstances of what happened. But analyzing the moment without any bias, that is more than fair. As you well know, the main event was Sting defending the world title against Jeff Hardy, a rematch from their significant first encounter just 10 nights earlier. From the jump, it was pretty obvious that something wasn't right. Hardy's theme played for close to 45 seconds before he finally emerged from the entrance set, and when Hardy did, he was clearly lethargic, stumbling a bit as he made an otherwise understated entrance to the ring. Sting entered second and looked maximally energetic by comparison. The two received the big fight intros from Jeremy Borash, but before the match could begin, authority figure Eric Bischoff hit the ring and was walking with a purpose. Now, he improvised a promo while giving rather overt verbal cues to both men off mic. Bischoff informed us that this match would now be a no disqualification bout. What Bischoff was actually doing with this appearance was telling both men the new finish. Sting pins Hardy immediately and then everybody gets the hell out of that ring. And that is exactly what happened. Sting clubbed away a mystified Hardy before pulling him in for the Scorpion death drop, then forcibly held him down for a shoot pin in less than 90 seconds. Everybody was shocked and confused, especially Hardy, who got right up after the pin to ask what was going on. As Sting left ringside, fans started chanting BS and the usually placid icon bellowed back, I agree. According to Bischoff, Hardy showed up on time for the day's pay-per-view, but then disappeared for hours, going somewhere private where he presumably indulged in whatever it was he was messed up on. Now, reportedly, Hardy didn't turn back up until just before his match, at which point he was clearly in no condition to work. It was too late to quickly substitute another wrestler in, so the quick finish was the only way to go. Hardy was sent home from TNA for a very long time. The incident occurred right at a time where Hardy was facing some very serious legal issues after a large quantity of illegal substances was found in his home a year and a half earlier. Nonetheless, TNA was keen to book Hardy as a star attraction while the legal process played out, and it burned them in about the most humiliating way possible. He completed a four-month stint in rehab after Victory Road, and Hardy returned full-time to TNA before the end of 2011, but not before he was sentenced to 10 days in jail for the prior arrest. TNA was so red-faced by the fiasco and the lackluster event as a whole that they actually posted a written apology to its viewers, while also offering six months of free access to their online video library to anyone, anyone that had purchased Victory Road. All 17,000 people. As for how Alvarez found those final two matches, well, let's take a look at the ratings. But by the looks of it, I don't think you really needed to ask to find out what those matches were going to be rated. Victory Road 2011 was supposed to just be a quick bridging show, a quick lunch before the hearty feast that lockdown was designed to be. You know, a throwaway show. It probably goes without saying that more fans remember Victory Road than remember that year's lockdown. Hey, what, what actually happened in uh, Lethal Lockdown that year? Ric Flair competed in Lethal Lockdown. <laughs> what did he bleed everywhere as his as his pants fell down? Oh, oh, no, I've not, I've not actually seen the show. I'm just sort of guessing. 
After the abrupt ending to the main event, poor Mike Tanay and Taz were left to stall for time by recapping all the earlier matches. Given the sour ending, you'd think a thorough recap would emphasise all the good qualities of the pay-per-view, but really the only thought one could possibly have was, man, without fortune this show would have been a complete disaster. As of 2023, users at the Cage Match database gave Victory Road a score of 2.06 out of a possible 10. Two thirds of the users rated the event a two or less. Fortune could really only do so much, it seems. Yes, this was a debacle. The horrible conclusion, the amateur hour undercard, the lousy finishes, and a dead crowd. The ending understandably gets the most attention, which takes the heat off everything else wrong with this show. Now, if this show is considered Victory Road, it's only because someone blindly took a wrong turn.